Yeah, so this is, this is kind of new. This is the first time I've been on a stage with like proper spotlights. So I can't actually see anybody. I'm, I'm not decided yet if I like this or if this is a good thing or a bad thing. But yeah, thank you for my introduction. So um, I'm Aaron Bassett. My talk is on Reduce, Reuse, Recycle. Um, it's actually going to be about uh, WebSockets and how we can persist and reuse WebSockets using local shared workers. So what that's going to do with Django is we're going to be using uh, Django channels um, to actually create our WebSocket server as well. So my name, again, Aaron Bassett. You can find me in most places as Aaron Bassett. I am that imaginative. That is my Twitter and my GitHub and everything else. Um, if you do follow me on Twitter, I normally tweet about Python, um, travel pictures, how idiotic Brexit is, usual kind of stuff. Uh, I will be tweeting later on today, though, about all the code and things that um, I've written for this talk. So if you would like to, to have a, a deeper dive into the code itself or to give the demos a try yourself, um, you'll find that all on my, my Twitter uh, later on this afternoon. So I am a developer advocate. Uh, for anybody who's never heard the term developer advocate before, it's basically a recovering software engineer who now spends a lot of time writing and sleeping on airplanes. I work for a company called Nexmo. Check out the snazzy branding. Um, we have been a sponsor here of DjangoCon um, for, for three years now, I think, um, which is basically the length of time our developer relations team has, has been in existence. We do APIs for telef telephone and SMS and all that kind of stuff. I'm not going to go into that now. Um, if you want to talk to us about it, we have the booth there. there come speak to us. But DjangoCon is, is one of our favorite uh, conferences. It's, it's personally one of my favorites as well. It's actually the conference where I gave my first ever conference talk. Um, was at DjangoCon Europe back in 2015 um, in Cardiff. Yeah, woo, four years. Uh, <laughs> and at that talk, I was actually um, weirdly talking about WebSockets as well. It was another talk about uh, doing effortless real-time apps in Django. Now, at that time, um, in order to do WebSockets in Django, to do real-time apps, it was a little bit more complex than it is today. So, <laughs> slightly. So yeah, so that was a good kind of 45-minute talk on basically how you could mangle together Django and uh, Tornado and Redis to, to allow you to have WebSocket connections. And my first conference talk, I was quite proud of it. I was quite looking forward to becoming one of these speakers who tours the world, you know, giving the same talk over and over again. Um, and then after my talk, I went to uh, one of the breaks, and a gentleman, one of the core developers, sat down beside me, and was, um, we had a very interesting conversation on what they felt the, the direction for Django should be with um, async. That person was Andrew. Hey, Andrew. <laughs> and basically, two weeks to the day after my talk, this email landed on the Django developers mailing list. So um, if it's too small for people to read, basically, this is um, Andrew announcing channels um, and completely making my entire talk obsolete. So, nice. <laughs> I, I know technology has a shelf life and things move on. And like if you're watching a conference video or reading a blog post, you know, a couple of years later, you expect things to be slightly different, but two weeks? <laughs> but yeah, I can't be better. Um, as you saw from the, the graph I had at the start there, um, things were very, very complicated before channels came along. Um, I did an entire 45-minute talk basically just on how to get WebSockets working in Django. I think in this talk, um, setting up the, our uh, channel consumers is going to be maybe like four slides. So um, yeah, as, as much as, as it pained me to have to, to stop giving that talk after its first outing, um, it's, uh, we've, we really have moved a long way with channels, and uh, Andrew deserves a, a lot of um, kudos for that. So I keep talking about WebSockets. And what are WebSockets? So, if we go back to the, the prehistoric days of browsers, you know, <laughs> all the way back to 1997. Back then, if you, if you had a client come to you and wanted to have any kind of real time in their application, say their, their kids are constantly on this new AOL Instant Messenger thing, you know, they want to add chat to their website as well, you basically only had one tool available to you, and that was iFrames. You know, 1997, iframes weren't just in an explorer, and that was the first time you could actually update a partial part of the page. Before that point, if you wanted to update anything in a web browser, you had to issue a new re full uh, browser refresh or full request to the server and do the whole request response cycle again. With the introduction of iframes, we could now start to, to update just partial parts of the page. Or if you used a technique called forever frames, then essentially you got your server to send um, a 
header which says that the transfer encoding is chunked. So chunked means that the server doesn't actually know how big the file is going to be. So it asks the browser to essentially con continue downloading the file until the server tells it to stop. So whenever you've got a forever frame open like that, then your server can start pushing out script tags to it. So essentially what we have here is the size of the chunk and then a script tag with some JavaScript in it. So your server could continue to push out these script tags and then this, the JavaScript would get executed within the iframe on the site. Um, and until you basically send a chunk with a zero size, then that frame would just keep trying to load for as long as it could. So that allowed you to essentially push out um, things we rendered in the browser in a kind of real-time fashion. Now, it only worked because JavaScript, the browser had rendered JavaScript as soon as it received it. It wouldn't wait for the entire page to download before it would execute the JavaScript. And this became the basis of a technique known as Comet. Now, Comet went through a couple of variations. You know, it started off with using iframes. Um, Flash made an appearance for a while as well. You could do Comet with Flash. You, there was Comet using ActiveX controls or Java applets. Eventually, it moved on to JavaScript, where we're using the XML HTTP request object, or AJAX which was the really cool thing like five years ago. Um, and in Ajax, this example here is using a technique called long polling. So essentially in long polling, you're opening up a Ajax connection to the server, um, and it's just keeping that connection open for, I think this one's like 60 seconds. Now, at any point during that 60 seconds, if the browser has some new information to provide to the client, then it sends that information through, the on success handler fires, and we start a new polling back to the, the server again. Or if this server doesn't have any information within before the timeout, the timeout's reached, then we, we fire our on failure handler, and we start a new poll again. So it's just, we're constantly pulling, or pulling the server for new information. Now, there's a few problems with this. The first is it's, it's a hack. You know, this is not the way this technology was supposed to be used. It's not how it was envisioned it was going to be used. So it turned out it was pretty brittle. You know, um, there were different ways in which different browsers dealt with um, certain timeouts, et cetera. And it, yeah, it, it, it was something that you could never really depend upon. And that's why a lot of the different Comet frameworks would have multiple different ways of doing this. You know, ones might fall back to iframes or what might have uh, ActiveX controls that fall back to Flash and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we had to have all these different kind of failovers and different methods, and each one had its own limitations, and you ended up like having different shims in from, and it was just a mess. The um, second problem with it is the servers are not really designed to hold open connections for this length of time. You know, um, web servers at the time were essentially designed that whenever a request comes through, that it would get the answer to that request as quick as it could and send it as a response. So you could have a single process that you know, could be dealing with multiple people because although the, process, the actual requests are queued, each request is finishing quickly enough that you can just go on straight to the next request and keep answering on that way. Whenever we got to long polling, where we're holding the connection open for you know, multiple seconds, a minute, maybe more, then you can very quickly start to use up your server resources. And the third issue uh, actually is file size. So whenever you're making a HTTP request, there's a lot of information that gets passed around in headers. So this is a uh, HTTP request to the uh, DjangoCon Europe website. It's very typical style request. It's actually smaller than a lot of them because I don't have any cookie information, I don't believe, in that one. So cookies can obviously take up a lot of information as well, and they're passed back and forth in each request. You've got all the things there about which languages I'm willing to accept, what type of uh, character encodings I can accept, et cetera, et cetera. So with the response as well, the response is reasonably large. You know, it's going to be telling things like um, when the file was last updated, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So with these kind of things, then, um, it might only kind of add up to a couple of hundred uh, bytes. But when you compare it to a WebSocket request, and a WebSocket response, there's obviously a huge difference in size. So that difference in size, as I said, probably only a couple of hundred bytes, doesn't sound like an, a huge amount in the grand scheme of things. And it's not. If you only have, like, maybe one or two connections, then that's fine. You know, but as the number of people trying to like access your um, website increases, then obviously you're, you're going to, uh, that couple hundred bytes or five, six hundred bytes is going to um, start to build up. In fact, if you have 100,000 users polling once every second with a, a header size of, I think, like 760 bytes or so, that just in headers information, just information you don't actually require, is 660 megabytes per second. Now, if you compare that to 100,000 users over WebSockets, Again, pushing data every second, 
that is 1.5 megabytes per second. You know, so that's a saving of, only for only 100,000 users, that's a saving of over like 600 megs per second. You know, it, it becomes substantial. Um, and I'm, I'm looking over here to my uh, Australian friends as I'm saying most of this stuff, because obviously if you're dealing with uh, countries that have data caps, pushing out any additional information that you don't need to send um, is actually really detrimental to your users as well as your, your own um, kind of bandwidth usage. One of the other benefits of WebSockets is they are bi-directional. So in all the examples I had there of long polling, we could only receive information from the server. We couldn't actually send information back to the server without starting another request. You know, so if in the middle of our long polling session, if we suddenly, the user, and there's some input, or we have something else we want to send to the server, we need to start a new request for it. With WebSockets, it's bi-directional. We can send the data back and forward all the time. Also, WebSockets, you don't need to just transfer text back and forward. They can take binary information as well. So in this example, um, this is a, uh, a recording of a uh, workshop that I've given a couple of times, a Python workshop. And it's actually taking the audio of a telephone call and sending that over a WebSocket. And we take that audio data, we send it to IBM, they do some magic with it, and they send us back, send, send them analysis of the audio. So the things getting graphed here is uh, whether the person is happy, sad, fearful, disgusted, or joyful. Um, and it's all getting done in real time. And that's all getting pushed over WebSockets. So the audio data goes through to IBM over WebSocket, and the data that we send to the browser is going over another WebSocket. So they can be pretty useful for some situations you may not. It's not just like all chat applications and stock tickers or things you can do with it as well. OK, before we get into the actual code, there's a, a few terms that we need to know make things a lot easier to understand. WebSockets are event-driven. So all of these are like events that we need to, to handle. So these events can occur pretty much at any time. It's not like a request response, where you have a request and you have a response. You know, this, an event can be triggered, and we need to have a handler for that. So the first one is on open. You know, this is whenever we create our WebSocket connection. We have an on message. Now, because WebSockets are bi-directional, this message could be, could be triggered on the server or on the client, depending upon which one is sending the information. We have on error, which, as it sounds like, is if there's any kind of error in the connection. And we have on close. Again, the on close is probably only really ever going to get fired um, normally by the on the server whenever the client um, kills the connection. But it is possible for it to be on the, the client as well, the server terminates it for whatever reason. Normally, you don't need to worry about like, actually triggering the on close event yourself. If you close a tab or the browser window, or whatever, it'll trigger it for you. We have a couple of methods. We have our send method. This is how we send information back and forward along that, that bi directional WebSocket. And then we have our close, which I've mentioned we don't really need to worry about too much. Normally, whenever we're dealing with it in browser contexts, they'll send the, the close event for you. OK, so some code. So this is the channels code that I, I kind of promised we'd look at. Um, don't worry, I'm going to blow it out on the side, so hopefully it's a bit easier to see. So with channels, they're very much this, or very similar to class-based uh, views in Django. We have a routings file, which points a URL at a, um, one of our consumers. And um, our consumers then are set up as uh, classes. Here you can see we have a async WebSocket uh, consumer class. But instead of where on our class-based views, we would have a get method to handle a get request. Here we have a connect method to handle an on-connection event. So in our connect method, all this uh, consumer is going to do, all our WebSocket server is going to do, is count how many clients are connected to it and return that information to all the clients that are connected. So when we see the demo, we can see every time I open a new browser context, it's going to increase the, the number of connections. So to do that, we just store the connections in Redis. So I have a, a connections value here that I'm incrementing. I'm also storing the time of the last connection. Um, and then whenever there is a new connection, I'm going to tell all of the connected clients that there's a new connection. So we can see this updated in our browsers, et cetera. Our disconnect handler pretty much the same idea. You know, except in this instance, instead of incrementing that value, we're going to decrement that value, and then we're going to push that out again to everything that's connected. So every time there's a new client connects, we increment the value. Every time we get a disconnect event, we decrease the value, and we update everything that's connected so we can see that happening in real time. So that's the, the channel side of code. As I said, Last time I gave this talk about WebSockets, it took like 45 minutes to get to that point. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much, Andrew. It made it an awful lot easier. Um, 
But yeah, so let's look at some of the browser side. So in the browser, um, we have our, chat, our WebSocket connection. So here we're creating a connection to the, the WebSocket server. And then we have this on message event. So essentially, this is what's triggered any time there is new data being sent from the server to the client. And in this case, all that data is going to be is a, the current connection count, how many clients are connected to um, our server, as well as uh, when the last connection was. We also have it on close. So if there is, for whatever reason, a, a uh, connection is, is killed that we didn't mean to, then we'll be notified of that as well. And this is what the demo kind of looks like. So every time I click this Add button, what it's going to do is it's going to add a new iframe to the page. So we can see there is each new iframe is added to the page. That's a new browser context. That creates a new connection to our WebSocket server. OK, as I remove iframes from the page, again, it's going to reduce the number of connections to that server. So we're back in this like too many cat situation here. You know, every time somebody opens a new browser tab or um, we've got a frame on the page or whatever else, we're opening another connection to the WebSocket server. Now, this can become problematic if you're using a um, likes of Pusher which is a service for uh, basically offering WebSockets as a service um, because they charge per connection. So um, if you have a customer who's opened up 10 tabs as a browsing your site, you're paying 10 times as much for that customer as you could be. Um, if you're doing something where you're transferring lots of data, like the demo I had of doing uh, audio over WebSockets, and you've got a customer who's got four or five uh, tabs open, then you're pushing out four or five times the amount of data that you need to be. So shared web workers to the rescue. So shared web worker is essentially, well, it's a web worker that's shared. Um, what's a web worker? So web worker is a piece of JavaScript that can run outside of the main browser context. So normally workers would be used if you have something that's very CPU intensive, that you can hand off the computation of it to a, essentially a background task, a different thread, without locking up your main browser context. So your site is still responsive. A shared web worker is the same idea, except it's shared between any pages that are on the same origin. So same ports, same hosts, same protocol. And this is essentially our, our shared web worker. So here, um, we have an onConnect event. This is not the onConnect event for our web sockets. This is the onConnect event for our web worker. This is the bit that tripped me up the most when trying to get my head around these concepts. It's they share so many terms that are the same. So here, we're, our client is not connecting to a WebSocket. We don't have a WebSocket connection yet. It's connecting to the web worker, the shared web worker. Whenever it connects, we have this um, event that's passed through. It has a port on it. And that's the port that we can use then to communicate with the browser context, with the different pages, the different tabs, the different frames. These um, ports are very much like the WebSocket connection itself in that they're bidirectional. So we can send information from our shared worker to our page and from our page back to our shared worker. So we're going to store a list of all of the workers, that are, sorry, all of the pages that are connected to our worker. Then we're going to check to see if we currently have a WebSocket connection. If we don't have a WebSocket connection, then we create it. And this is the WebSocket connection, and it will be persisted and will be used by all of the um, browser contacts that connect to our shared worker. Then finally, we have this. A uh, little bit. So this is a bit confusing again. So I'm going to break it down like line by line. So here we have our shared web socket on message. So this is anytime we receive a message on our web socket, not our web worker, but the web socket. So anytime some new data essentially is getting passed from the server to our browser as a whole, so all of our contexts. So anything that's coming from the browser to the server, it's going to be this on message event. Then we have our connections. So this is the connections object that we were adding all of our browser context to. So we're going to loop over each of these connections. And these connections are the browser contexts that are connected to our shared web worker. They're not WebSocket connections. They are the browser context connected to our web worker. As we iterate over each of those, then we're going to use the send message to send the data that we've just received over the WebSocket server to each of the browser contexts. So essentially, we're using the shared web worker as essentially a proxy um, to all of our browser contexts. So our server has a single point of contact, which will then disseminate all the information to all the browser contexts. You know, so we only have one WebSocket connection, multi as many browser contexts as we wish. So this is what it kind of um, looks like all together then. And this is what we change on the, brow on the browser side. So before, instead of having our WebSocket connection, 
we now have our web worker connection. So essentially, it's just the location of the JavaScript file that we want to execute as a web worker. And again, we have this on message. Now, this is not, <laughs> as I said, they use so much of the similar language, it can be so easy to get tripped up. These messages are not messages that are coming from the WebSocket connection. They are messages that are coming from the shared web worker. So whenever we iterated over all those web worker connections that we saw in the previous or a couple of slides ago, and we use that push message, this is the event that it's going to end up triggering. So these, this is running in each of our browser contexts. So each of those iframes has got a connection to that shared web worker. That shared web worker is then opening up a communication channel, bi-directional communication channel, and it can then push messages from the worker back into the browser context. So we have the server pushing messages to a worker over a WebSocket connection. And then we have the worker pushing messages to all of our browser contexts through its port. And what it looks like is this. So now we can see as I'm clicking the Add button, we have a connection. But as I add more and more iframes, the number of connections doesn't increase. It stays the same. So each of these iframes um, are using that same shared worker. One thing to, to note, however, you can't really see in the demo, is that shared worker will only exist as long as there's at least one browser context connected to it. The second that you close that, that last browser context, that worker is killed as well. So you can't start a worker doing something in the background, close your laptop, go to, or close your browser, go do something else, come back in a couple hours and open up the browser and reconnect to that worker again. That worker is gone. It's been killed as soon as you close your browser. So as long as you have, but as long as you have one, at least one connection open to the worker, um, then that, it will, you can persist it and you can connect multiple browser contexts to it. It also only works within the same browser. So in this one on the top is Chrome, on the bottom is Firefox. And uh, Firefox opens um, connected to the, the same WebSocket connection. And as you see, whenever I start adding them then, it then jumps to two connections. But as I add more in Chrome, it doesn't increase beyond two. So it has one connection per browser. But you can have as many connections within the same browser, and it'll still use that same shared worker. They're not shared between browsers. Speaking of browsers, browser support is OK. <laughs> um, no support in, in IE or Edge, which is so surprising. Um, I've not actually had an opportunity yet to check it in um, the latest uh, version of Internet Explorer, the one that's based in Chromium. Um, I'm assuming it will work in that, because it, it works for Chrome. Um, but does not work in IE, works in Chrome, works in Firefox. It did work in Safari, and then they removed it. Um, which is unfortunate, because if it's been removed from Safari, it's also not supported in iOS, and it could be pretty useful in iOS. I wouldn't hold my breath about it ever getting support again in Safari. Um, this is one of the Safari developers, whenever they were asked about whether or not it would be coming back into Safari. Um, the, it's unfortunate it's not more widely supported than essentially Chrome, uh, Firefox, and Opera. But you can use object detection on it. So as you saw, I didn't need to make any changes to my server side code at all. My, my channels code remained exactly the same. For my client side code, the code was more or less the same. I just abstracted part of it away into the worker, but the actual on message events remained exactly the same. So having it available to browsers that do have support for shared web workers, while also supporting older browsers, is not an issue at all. It just means that any of your users that have a browser that supports it, they're obviously going to be using, um, it's going to be more responsive, or sorry, uh, they'll have less latency and it's going to be using less resources for you. So it's kind of a win-win for both. So that's pretty much everything I have on it. I'm going to stick this slide up again so people can follow me and stuff. Um, I wanted to leave a few minutes for questions. I'm also going to be on the, the, the booth for the rest of the day. Um, so if you do have any, uh, want to talk about it in any detail or you want to ask me anything about channels, that I'll just point at Andrew and go, go talk to him. Um, but yeah, uh, anybody got any questions now? Oh, this time it's working. Oh, you get a spotlight as well. This is awesome. Oh, cool. <laughs> okay. I'm going to ask two questions, actually. First, um, you said for each browser, it's opening a new connection. What about incognito mode? Oh, good question. Um, I've not actually tried that, to be honest. So I'm assuming because it's in it's another browser context that um, whenever you're... It's, 
this is my assumption, so I would need to, to verify this. I would assume that it will treat um, incognito mode the same as a separate browser. So the browser contexts within incognito mode can probably share um, one uh, web worker, but it won't be able to share it with tabs that are outside of incognito mode, would be my, kind of my gut reaction to this. I'll need to double check, though. It's, it's OK. I, just, I was curious. <laughs> and my second question is, you said, like, OK, we close our uh, laptop, and the connection got closed as well. Mm -hmm. And then we open it back, but the web page is there. Probably the, I don't know, the iframe, the chat screen is there. <laughs> OK. Where do, where do we go from there? Do we display um, well, remote I, or? No, it can, just, it can just start up again. What, what I meant was, if you have, um, say you're running a, a long computational process in a web worker, um, if you close your tab, that will kill that process. So you couldn't like, start it doing some major number crunching, um, and then like, close out your tabs, go do something else, come back later, revisit the page, and expect it to connect back to that same worker. Whenever you close that tab, that worker is closed as well. So um, with the shared workers, obviously, they'll, they'll remain open as long as there's at least one tab or browser context open for it. But as soon as you close it, it's going to kill the worker. So whenever you come back, obviously, it can start a new worker. It can start a new WebSocket connection. That's all fine. Not a problem there. But it, it won't be the same worker that you left. So any additional uh, data that you've stored in the worker, any kind of like context that you've made available, et cetera, um, that will all be gone as well. So you'll need to have some other kind of storage, whether it be the browser storage, et cetera, that you can populate that from. Thank you. No problem. Um, so some companies have the tendency to block long-running HTTP requests and by extension then WebSocket, since you can proxy everything over it. What do you think would be possible fallbacks in that regard if you have to assume that the WebSocket will get killed like after five seconds or something? So it would be... Um, disappointing if they were killing WebSocket connections because they're not a long-running uh, HTTP request. Essentially, they're a new type of connection, and they're running over their own port. Um, it should be easy to identify that something is a WebSocket connection rather than a regular HTTP. Or, no, they're not a port. Sorry, disregard that bit. But it's easy to, to to detect when something is a WebSocket connection rather than a regular HTTP re connection. So in that instance, it's really down to whoever is configuring the the actual rules for the networks. You know, they they should be aware that. This is not a runaway connection. Um, you know, it's not something that is timing out or um, that, is not, is, that is behaving irregularly. This is how this is designed to behave. And I would say that's actually a configuration problem with them rather than something that we should be trying to work around with WebSockets. Hello there. Enjoyed your talk. Um, I'm curious about how this changes uh, when after we're using HTTP 1.1 right now, but HTTP 2 is coming down the line at all. And if it's a long answer, I can, I'm happy, but like, how does it change when all the browsers start using HTTP2 or something like that? Um, I don't have the answer to that. I'm sorry. It's not something I've looked into. Um, okay. But yeah, I'd be happy to talk about it later on. Cool, thank you. Hello. Do you think hey. it would be possible to have a JavaScript library that would seamlessly implement it in a web worker? And if not available, like in Safari, it would fall back to the WebSocket? Um, potentially, what I think probably would be easier to do is to switch out whether you're using a shared web worker or just a regular web worker. Um, so most of the browsers have good support for web workers. Um, so really, it would just be changing what your, your import was, essentially. Thank you very much, Aaron. Can we get another big round of applause? <laughs>